Hello, everybody, and it's a real joy and a pleasure to be here with you to talk about some of the feedback from the recent International AIDS Conference, which was held in Brisbane. And I, for me, the key and most important uh, findings from the conference were all about complications and comorbidities. And I'm going to try in 20 minutes to summarize the key points that came up at the conference. So here are my conflicts of interest. So I'm going to focus on three areas. Um, the first variable of interest was hypertension, and then there was diabetes, and then there was the issue of statins and dyslipidemia. So I think what I'll start with is that when we think about hypertension, what we know is that people uh, living with HIV are aging and with longer life expectancy, people are being affected by metabolic complications, including hypertension. We know that hypertension itself is actually already very prevalent uh, in about, it's about 53% amongst people living with HIV on treatment based on a number of studies. And we also know that immunological activation and inflammation due to HIV uh, may exacerbate hypertension and cardiovascular disease risk. But there's been a conflicting understanding about the potential role of integrase inhibitor-based combinations in hypertension incidence. So, a couple of cohorts have shown differing findings. The RESPON cohort had found a high inst instance of hypertension compared with NNRTIs, but not compared to boosted PIs. And the REPRIEVE cohort had found no association between hypertension and integrase inhibitors. This is before the conference. So, moving into the conference, uh, there are a number of presentations. So, the first one I'll cover is a Dolutegavir trial meta-analysis, which was delivered by Vive Healthcare and presented by Bryn Jones. And this was looking at data from first-line therapy, people with HIV on dolutegavir-based treatment with whatever other combination versus other therapies from a number of studies, the spring studies, the single studies, and the flamingo studies. And they looked at blood pressure and weight measurements, which were taken at week 48 and 96. Um, some of these studies took additional measurements uh, which they also analyzed. And these analyzed were all uh, analyzed separately based on hypertension at baseline. And they were looking at incident hypertension and also looking at blood pressure changes. And they defined this as a single systolic blood pressure and or a diastolic blood pressure of greater than 140-90 using antihypertensives or a reported hypertensive event. And they looked at adjusted, adjusted proportions based on baseline covariates and mean changes. And they used mixed metal, mixed model repeated measures and logistic regression. So the takeaways, I won't summarize the whole study, but the takeaways are from this is that people living with HIV without hypertension at baseline, uh, they found that the odds of de de uh, developing incident hypertension at week 96 did not differ in those people receiving dolutegravir versus comparative treatments. And in participants without evidence of baseline hypertension, uh, blood pressure increases were small and not clinically significantly different from those without dolutegravir. They did find uh, that people who are older, black or African or American race, higher baseline viral load and higher baseline BMI were associated with increased adjusted odds of incident hypertension. And they found that in first-line therapy, people living with HIV uh, with evidence of baseline hypertension, uh, they noticed decreases uh, across both groups. So uh, in, uh, in summary, the VIV trials do not support an association between uh, incident hypertension and dolutegravir. But when we look at the cohorts, there were several cohorts that assessed this. There was firstly the RESPOND cohort, which is from Europe and Australia, 9,700 people. And there were two Zimbabwean cohorts uh, looking at this issue. In the RESPOND cohort, what they found is that 30% developed hypertension over 40,000 pa uh, patient years of follow-up. Uh, so they did associate a current use of integrase inhibitors with or without TAF to be associated with hypertension. Um, and they found that the effect of hypertension was attenuated by time-adjusted BMI which means that as people got fatter, 
um, you, you could see that there was some association with BMI, but even when you adjust for BMI, the effect did persist. In, Zimbab in the Zimbabwean cohort, uh, in those people with no hypertension at baseline, they found strong evidence for an increase in median systolic blood pressure, more so in males and females. Um, and of course, we know that males are less likely to access care. Uh, in those with hypertension at baseline, they found increases of both systolic and blood, diastolic blood pressure. Um, and with the other Zimbabwean cohort, um, in this cohort, they uh, looked at uh, uh, dolutegravir and they found uh, a substantial increase in percentage with high blood pressure um, from around 5% at baseline to more than 20% at two years after switching to dolutegravir. And they did find this the same association with males versus females and in overweight versus obese. Um, and they found the same thing in those that were already hypertensive. Interestingly, for people on efavirenz and atizanavir based treatment, they found no evidence of increased blood pressure. So here is the cohort evidence, which is in favor of this. <laughs> However, there were some randomized controlled trials presented as well. There was a paper uh, from uh, the NAMCEL group presented by Francois Fenta and Advance. So he summarized both studies. As we know, these were both studies taking place in sub-Saharan Africa, the NAMCEL study in the Cameroon, the Advance study at a single Johannesburg clinic. Um, and what they found in the NAMCEL study is that hypertension increased over time in both arms. Uh, the mean systolic blood pressure is significantly greater in the INSTI arm by week, six, week 60. Um, and they found significant differences in percentage with systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure elevations by week 144 and in all grades of hypertension. That was in the Cameroonian study versus efavirenz. Uh, and people were very unlikely to be treated for hypertension in the study. So it was a group of people that were not actually really readily accessing treatment for hypertension. In the advanced study in Johannesburg, they did find treatment emergent grade one hypertension significantly higher for dolutegravir plus FTC and TAF versus the Favarin's FTC TDF at week 192. And they found differences in both systolic and uh, diastolic blood pressure. The next study was the DEFT study, and this is a, a, a study uh, in which they uh, looked at people with hypertension excluded in the primary analysis. And this study had three arms, darunavir, ritonavir plus two NRTIs, dolutegravir plus darunavir versus dolutegravir plus XTC and TDF. And this was a second line therapy study, so a slightly different population. They found at week 48 greater mean changes in systolic and diastolic blood pressure with dolutegravir and darunavir versus darunavir ritonavir and two nucleosides, even adjusting for weight. And they found that numerically, uh, numerically greater changes in, in blood pressure, but not statistically significantly, with dolutegravir XTC TDF versus darunavir plus two NRTIs. So they they found this when they sanctioned people with those with hypertension at baseline, they found similar results. So in PrEP, there was a study that also looked at retrospectively from the Kaiser Permanente study at those initiating PrEP with FTC and TAF or FTC TDF. And they found that the risk of developing hypertension and initiating statin use during the study period were both higher amongst those using FTC and TAF than FTC TDF. So I'm going to move to diabetes now. Uh, it's been suggested that people living with HIV may have a higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes attributable, attributable to chronic inflammation uh, and possibly the effects of antiretroviral therapy as well as traditional diabetes risk factors. But existing studies have mainly focused on people living with HIV on treatment. Uh, there was a systematic review of meta-analysis, which I've listed here. Uh, which was looking at cross-sectional cohort or case control studies with base, baseline information on diabetes prevalence, uh, looking at prevalence estimates uh, in terms of uh, diabetes. And they looked at 74 studies um, between 2005 and 2022, majority of which uh, were from high-income countries, finding a pool prevalence of diabetes of 5%, which differed by income level, but there was no uh, difference by age, CD4 count, viral lo load, or year of publications. They found amongst the studies that reported estimates by antiretroviral and HIV status, the prevalence was 3.6% um, and 5.5% in those without HIV, 
So there was no evidence of publication bias. So that's just to show you, uh, you know, some some baseline um, in, information or what we might expect in terms of diabetes mellitus. So what they concluded from this is that the prevalence of diabetes in the global population of people not yet on treatment is lower than in the general population. Um, and it's also lower than compared to those people who are treated. Okay. So it does look as though there is some, um, it's, so you can see a, a lower uh, prevalence of diabetes in those people not on treatment, um, but also a lower prevalence compared to those uh, while treated. Now, um, the RESPOND cohort, uh, as, as once again from Europe and Australia, looking at 20,000 records, compared integrase inhibitor-based treatments versus others, and they found uh, 785 participants with diabetes. Uh, they, dis they discovered that those with diabetes had higher median BMIs and higher age, and they found that integrase inhibitor use and higher BP uh, was uh, associated with diabetes, which is, and the absolute risk increased with integrase inhibitors was three per thousand person years. So they found that a current use of an integrase inhibitor was associated with a 48% increased incidence of diabetes versus NNRTI-PI. And this was only partially controlled by adjusting for BMI and other variables. Um, the next issue was hyperlipidemia. We know that HIV is a pro-inflammatory state. We also know that there are some interactions with statins. Um, and we know that cardiovascular acidity is a very important comorbidity um, and that there's excess plaque controlling for traditional risk even at a young age. Uh, we know that treatment does re reduce comorbidities, but that residual immune activation persists even with good suppression, and that treatment alone is not enough to prevent CVD. So the RESPOND cohort, once again, in 5,231 people, assessed dyslipidemia, and they found that 51.4% did develop dyslipidemia, and that current use of TAF with or without integrase inhibitors was associated with dyslipidemia. So that concurs with the PrEP study. And that adjusting for time-adjusted BMI did attenuate, so reduce the risk, but there was no interaction between uh, treatment and BMI. So in PrEP, um, as I've said to you, there was a higher uh, risk of initiating statin use based on the Kaiser Permanente data um, than those people uh, not using TAF. So that leads me to the reprieve study, which was really the big news of this conference. And this was really a, uh, this is a paper that's been published. Uh, the lead author is Steve Grinspoon. It's in the NEJM. It was in the NEJM last month. And it was looking at the potential benefits of statins beyond just reduction of LDL. And what they've postulated is that statins have anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, immunomodulatory, uh, reduction oxidative stress, improved endothelial function, and plaque st stabilization effects. So what they did is they looked at uh, a drug called pitivastatin, which is a mo moderate intensity statin with a low DDI liability to look at the effect on lowering cholesterol as well as immune activation and inflammation. And they took asymptomatic people on HIV treatment with low to moderate risk of cardiovascular disease, and they either gave them pitivastatin or gave them a placebo, and they monitored them for up to three to eight years. And the clinical primary endpoint was time to a major adverse cardiovascular event, such as cardiovascular death, an MI, an unstable angina, a TIA or stroke, or arterial vascularization or peripheral artery disease. And secondary endpoints were the individual components of this, all-cause mortality, and various other biomarkers. So the study population was those with documented HIV disease on stable treatment with CD4 counts greater than 100 and no known atherosclerotic or cardiovascular disease. And they divided them up into uh, their existing risk scores, and they couldn't already be on a statin. And you can see that they are enrolled globally in both high-income countries, as well as Latin America and Caribbean countries, South, Southeast and Eastern Asia, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So it was a truly global cohort, which is really impressive and important. When you look at the baseline characteristics, you can see the median age was around 50. Um, you can see the natal sex was predominantly uh, male, but 30% were female. 
and the predominant co- cohort were cisgender, but they did actually count transgender people, which is excellent. Um, and they, it was not a white cohort. It was a well-represented cohort with respect to race and ethnicity. You can see that predominantly people were well-controlled with CD4 counts of 600, uh, and the nadirs were uh, not particularly low. At least half had, had nadirs greater than 200. You can see um, that the, almost everybody was uh, less than the lower d- limit of detection, so undetectable. And the ACVD risk score percentage was 4.5%, and you can see the LDL levels at the bottom. The total amount of time on treatment, you can see that nearly half had, had spent more than 10 years on treatment. And you can see there was a wide variety of treatments uh, with an entry treatment regimen, mainly NNRTIs. Um, and you can see uh, regimen durations being quite variable. Um, so, as I've said, Reprieve is an events-driven trial, and it had an 85% power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.7 with 288 planned events. However, the Data Safety Monitoring Board convened once 75% of the information had been collected, they closed the trial, concluding that there were no unanticipated safety concerns and that the benefits of being on pitivastatin outweighed the risk of statin therapy. So it was ended early due to to excellent results for the pitivastatin and unfairness to continue uh, a placebo-controlled trial. So what you can see is the duration of follow-up for the study. So there's a significant amount of follow-up. And when you look at the primary endpoint in terms of the time to first major cardiovascular event, what you see is that uh, this is very well balanced in terms of the baseline characteristics, but pitivastatin prolonged the time to first major cardiovascular event. Uh, There was a 35% reduction versus the placebo. And when we look at first MACE or death, so mortality benefit, it was less than 21, so 21% reduced risk. So these are major, major, major findings. Uh, when you look at the origin, the individual MACE components, so you look at um, the secondary endpoints such as in, uh, first cardiac ischemia, first cerebrovascular disease, first per- peripheral art- artery ischemia, CV death, uh, or any other of these endpoints, you can see that there was statistically sig- significant benefit for pitivastatin versus not taking the statin. So the effect was consistent across all the major subgroups. Um, and you can also see that there was a reduction in LDL cholesterol. And these uh, effects persisted when adjusted for age, race, and smoking, hypertension, LDL cholesterol level, CD4 nadir, total treatment, and uh, the, the, the region. Um, And you can see that this was uh, highly significant. And when you look at um, the number needed to treat, what you can see is that you would need to treat 106 people overall to uh, prevent an event, which is, you know, very, very good and compares favorably the range of 80 to 160 for treating hypertension in other studies. As the risk score increases, what you see is the benefit increases significantly. So if you have an ACVD risk score greater than 10, uh, the number needed to treat is like 20 to 100. So this is extremely important and basically shows that there is a a great benefit as your risk goes up, but there's a huge benefit even at low to moderate risk. So there you see the number needed to treat to prevent one MACE event. It's pretty stark data. Um, And the effect is larger than anticipated based on just lowering cholesterol. So if you look at what was predicted, um, the risk, they would have predicted a 17% reduction based just on the LDL reductions, but the actual reduction was 35%. So the statin is having some sort of other effect. As I showed you in the first slide on this, it is postulated to have immunomodulatory effects other than uh, just cholesterol. So I think it's very clear that this is very likely to change the guidelines because currently um, it's not recommended for low risk, but I think it's now very, very clear that statins should be recommended. I think that the question is, will other statins work as well? We don't know, but it's very unlikely, in my opinion, that pit of a statin has some magical quality, which is unlike all other statins. We know that there are other low liability statins, such as 
uh, atorvastatin, which can be used in low doses, which is also moderate intensity, but clearly we shouldn't assume, and this should be further studied. Um, as I've said to you, we know that um, there, are, there are statins that are not as much metabolized through the pathways. So I think what we're saying is this is extremely important and that people with low to moderate risk and normal range LDL, um, pitavastatin was effective in pre preventing uh, major uh, cardiovascular events. So in take home, two retrospective studies on PrEP showed that you could reduce hypertension as well as uh, hyperlipidemia. Um, so so that the risk of hypertension and uh, statin use were higher on those uh, on FTC and TAF. Um, we can see that RESPOND found an association with integrase inhibitors and the absolute route of diabetes. There are a number of studies, both cohorts and randomized controls, showing associations between integrase inhibitor-based treatment and hypertension, as well as other metabolic outcomes. Some of this was attenuated at, and possibly attributable to BMI, which was increasing over time, but some of it wasn't. And as I've said in the reprieve study, there are some stunning results looking at uh, using a statin to decrease the risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event by 35% versus placebo, people living with treat HIV on treatment with low to moderate risk. And that's all I'm going to say, and I hope that you found this helpful. Many thanks for your attention. <laughs>